Uh, very good afternoon to all of you. Uh, welcome to the IMS Distinguished Visitor Lecture Series Come NUS Department of Mathematics Colloquium Lecture. It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, Professor Ingrid Dobbershiff from Duke University. Professor Dobbershiff is a well-known figure in many of the seminar works in time frequency analysis, wavelet analysis, signal analysis, and and other areas. And for many of our students and staff in the department who works on wavelets, I'm sure all of you know about, uh, have read her famous book on 10 lectures on wavelets, which is actually a lot of content, which takes much more than 10 lectures to digest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, her seminar works on wavelets has been uh, used in various areas of digital signal processing, including the JPEG 2000 image compression standard. And Professor Dobbershiff has many firsts in her CV. And there are so many firsts, so I'll just highlight a couple of them. And in, she received the National Academy of Science Award in Mathematics in 2010, uh, in 2000, and she's the first woman mathematician to receive this honor. She is also the president of the, the International Mathematics Union in 2010, and she is also the first woman president. And today, she will be here telling us about her work, and she, this is also her first visit to Singapore. And uh, if you look at the audience today, you see that there's really a wide range of uh, audience. We see mathematicians, we see people from overseas, and engineers, and in different sectors. And this is very, very a great reflection of her work that has impact in many, many different areas. And apart from Wavelet, she has done many new works on uh, signal analysis, and, and she will talk about various areas of application. So today, she will give a talk about using mathematics for art, conservation and tomorrow at the IMS she will give a second talk and this time on the different topic about biological this, uh, relevant distances about morphological surfaces representing teeth and bones so let us welcome Professor Dovashiv Times that I planned to come and that it didn't quite work out. And, uh, so uh, I'm going to give you a talk uh, in which I tell you about uh, 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 well, ways in which mathematicians uh, are helping art historians and art conservators, and it goes both ways. Uh, so I I, uh, I hope that the, the, the many people here who work on wavelets will forgive me that in this. Uh, 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 general talk, I give a blitz introduction to Wavelets first, and then uh, I'll go over to talk about these uh, projects that use uh, Wavelets and other image analysis tools for art, studying uh, artworks and helping uh, art historians and art conservators in their work. So, blitz introduction about Wavelets. So, I want to tell you uh, how you decompose into Wavelets, mathematical properties before we go to painting analysis. Uh, okay, so images consist of pixels. Uh, typically, they have uh, uh, in 8-bit images 256 uh, different gray values, numbered from 0 for all black to 255 for all white. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about, of course, applies to color images, uh, where you would have the same thing in the three channels are uh, red, green, and blue. Uh, color compression is a bit more complex than just black and white but we'll stick to black and white for most of, of what we're going to do. Uh, so here is a high-res uh, 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 scan of a, uh, a self-portrait by Van Gogh. And when you uh, enlarge it sufficiently, you start seeing the individual pixels. And uh, I've taken here this one line out of the image. Uh, to remind us that low numbers correspond to dark, I put them in bold, and higher numbers in lighter. 
and we're going to uh, I'm going to illustrate a wavelength algorithm by showing to you what I would do on these numbers, but you should imagine it happening all over the imagery. Um, so I will even do it on only that tiny little bit of, 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 of that row. And uh, one thing that's very striking, and that's true for uh, all uh, natural images and even many non-natural images. I mean, this is really not a natural image. I mean, you're photographing a painting, but it's also true in medical imaging and other uh, applications. That it, a lot of these pixel values are very close to their neighbors. Uh, now, of course, images have interesting content, and so it's not true all over the place. Otherwise, the images would be extremely boring. But uh, there are edges in some places, and they can be anywhere. But the places where you have a sudden transition like that are in minority. And that's what we're going to exploit for uh, way to transform. The idea is that if I were to take these in groups of two together, and uh, every time take only the average, I would have most of the information of the image. And even when I've done that, many of those numbers are still similar, so I can do it yet another time. Uh, missed information, of course. I mean, those 16 numbers contain more information than those four. But I can, at, for instance, in this transition, if I knew not only for each pair the average, but also their difference, then I could go back. And again, here, from this to there, if I knew also the difference of those numbers, I could go back. And uh, the fact that many of the original numbers were close to their neighbors is reflected by the fact that many of these red differences are very small. And occasionally, they're not. And that is when something interesting happens in the image. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, that's the crux of really what the wavelength transform uh, uh, does and why it's interesting. It's that you, you can compute it very, very easily. And uh, you then can throw away small wavelength coefficients and uh, uh, reconstruct something close to the original image. I'll come back to that, that story. Uh, what it really amounts to mathematically, what we've done is we started, I mean, the underlying function we were trying to model uh, in images is something that is smooth and may have some discontinuities. <coughs> uh, we already approximated that by a fine scale piecewise constant approximation when we measure pixel values. So I'll never, uh, for the moment, when I do image compression or image analysis, go beyond this. This is the resolution at which I get an image. Uh, now, when we uh, did the transformation, this, this fine scale approximation, we approximate it by, say, by taking groups of two. And in each of them, we uh, uh, computed a, a coarser approximation. We computed the average of two levels. And that gave us that coarser approximation at one scale coarser. And we did that again and again. So uh, we also looked at the differences. What that means is that we looked at the fine scale and the next coarser approximation. And I've shown here three uh, uh, places where I look at the difference. The difference function itself, of course, is this thing translated to, to, to zero. And uh, if you look at it everywhere, not just those three places, this is what it looks like. So the difference between two successive approximations has this kind of oscillating nature where every time I have that up level here and the down level here are equal because there are two differences with respect to the average level. And I have the same at the next uh, uh, transition. And again, and so I have done three steps, and I have gone from very fine scale to th in, 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 two, in three successive steps to a much coarser scale. And uh, the detail that I lost are these red functions, which it's very easy to see now, are all going to be uh, uh, multiples of building blocks that are exactly the same, except for scaling of factor two, and uh, translated around and uh, given the right amplitude. So what I, these building blocks in this case are, this is called the Haar wavelet. So I have that Haar function at many different, at, at three successively different scales that uh, uh, differ by a factor two. And I have that the uh, successive approximations are uh, multiples 
are, are, are multiples of these functions translated around. So uh, I have, I mean, if I do this over uh, a large number of scales instead of the three I had, then I have that a very fine scale approximation uh, here is given by a very coarse approximation. If L, I mean, if, if J is very a large number, a positive number, then I have a very fine scale approximation to be J. If I take capital L to be, let's say, 2J, then I go all the way to the, the step where I have uh, my, my discretization is, is, is a step with one, and beyond that. And so I may go to very, very coarse approximation in P uh, J minus L, which would become P minus J. And uh, all these successive differences can be written as combinations of, of these wavelet building blocks. Uh, also, it's easy to see from in the example that I was looking at, where my function is uh, uh, piecewise constant on the interval 0, 1, that if I take one that is twice as, as, as narrow, or even more narrow than that, it's going to, it has interval zero, and it lives completely where the other function is constant. And so these two functions are going to be orthogonal. And so you find that you can decompose anything, because as I approximate, as I let capital J tend to zero, this tends to F. So any F will be in, given by a decomposition of this type. This will tend to zero as J minus L, that's the negative infinity. So I find that I decompose arbitrary functions in this orthonormal family, and I have an orthonormal basis for L2 of R. So uh, what happens is that in, in uh, in, in, so I have this, this decomposition. In practice, so when I was computing, I took numbers in pairs and for these pairs I computed averages and then also differences uh, and I would then uh, read out my differences and then I would combine them again in averages in pairs and uh, differences of those. Uh, and I got a, a, a decomposition into building blocks that are not smooth. I can actually, uh, uh, I have to pay a little bit of attention to how I do it, but I can uh, uh, make uh, compute averages that are a little bit more, uh, that take into account not just the two parents, but also neighbors, and uh, get that way an approximation scheme uh, in which, uh, uh, sorry, this has to go further. Uh, in which I, I, the underlying functions become continuous, or even if I go to more uh, uh, filter taps, uh, have higher smoothness, and I, my differences likewise will become higher order differences instead of of, of, of just the, the, the differences I, I was computing here, um, and. Uh, but it's the, still the same thing uh, applies that I have a fast algorithm that decompose into orthonormal bases. The beautiful thing is that uh, the orthonormal bases you get that way are extremely useful for many applications. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to, to, to go much into the, the mathematical properties of it, of, but, but what happens is that there are many interesting function spaces for which you have a complete characterization in terms of the absolute values, so phase doesn't matter, of the wavelet coefficients. And uh, the characterization, so there's some function of, 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 of this that is finite, characterizes completely whether f is in that, that function space, and this is true for uh, a, a large a range of LP spaces, of social spaces, of roller spaces, and so on. And you have typically an if and only if thing using only absolute values. And moreover, this function is monotone. So the consequence of that is that uh, uh, in all of these spaces, we can approximate 
nicely by rounding up. So uh, in applications, that's typically what we do. If we have very small coefficients, we forget about them. If you work with Fourier basis, except if you work in an L2 uh, framework, you're really not allowed to do that. You can be in an LP space and uh, forget your small coefficients, and you kind of flip out of your space. You're not, no longer, you have no control over the norm. That's not true with weights, and that's because of this. Uh, so, just this, this little sidebar about the uh, uh, mathematical properties. Okay, but all that was uh, a little bit of a blitz thing about wavelengths in, in, in one dimension. Of course, wavelengths in uh, uh, images on which I want to work have two dimensions. So if I do this Van Gogh thing in two dimensions, then I get these numbers. And I will have to do my computations both horizontally and then vertically. And so I compute averages uh, uh, for each row. And uh, now I am aware, as no doubt you all have, are seeing immediately, that the average of 121 and 122 is not 120.5. I mean, but I made that mistake the first time I made that slide, and I thought I would keep it in. I mean, to bring home uh, the point that mathematicians are not necessarily the people who are best at balancing their checkbooks. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I get all these differences and averages. Now this was just working horizontally. I now also have to work vertically. So for each of these two arrays, I'm going to again do averaging and differencing. And uh, so I end up with three different arrays that contain differences. One in which I've averaged horizontally and then differenced vertically. And then one where I was differencing horizontally and whether I average or difference vertically, in both cases, it has some difference information there. Uh, what does this information correspond to? Well, if you imagine in your original image stripes, big horizontal stripes, dark and light, then it's obvious that when you average, you will get low numbers, high numbers, low numbers, high numbers. And when you difference, you will find large numbers in those differences. So large numbers here indicate this kind of horizontal stripe structure. Similarly, here, if I have a vertical stripe structure, then I will, when I difference horizontally, find a, a large minus a, a small number, a large difference, a large difference, a large difference, and so on. In the next row, I will find the same large differences. So when I average them, I retain them. Large numbers here give that structure. And this is the kind of, of structure you get that complements these stripes vertically or horizontally. It's what you get when you get a kind of checkerboard structure. And that gives large numbers here, which has both these and these diagonals. Now, if I want to do the algorithm, I will just do it over again on the uh, course approximation. Again, averages and differences both horizontally and vertically. And they indicate that similar structure, but at a coarser scale. So in the end, these 16 pixels would correspond to all these numbers, and then one average gray level. So let's see this on a real image. So if I average horizontally and vertically, then I will get uh, uh, that every uh, two pixels become one pixel in both directions. And so I get an image that's only half the dimension, both horizontally and vertically. Um, I am going to also show you the differences in, 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 in as an image, uh, uh, rendered as an image. Uh, because I'm taking differences, and because I have numbers from 0 to 255, I could in principle go from negative 255 to positive 255. So I, I need a different convention to show you those numbers. And what I'll do is that at one end, I'll use uh, uh, black. At the other end, I'll use all white. And so numbers that are close to zero, and I've argued that many of those would be, would be middle gray. So if I do that, indeed, I get something that's middle gray almost everywhere. Uh, what stands out are vertical features. And that's because I difference horizontally and then average vertically. Um, now, things when I difference vertically, I'll have two species, namely, depending on what I do horizontally, and uh, those are the resulting coefficients. I have horizontal features here and diagonal features there, but most of the coefficients are very close to zero. And then just like I did in 1D, I'll, this is still an image, so I can do it again. So on that image, I will repeat the 
same operation, I average, and I have its three different uh, uh, things, and these contain the same information as the lower scale approximation did here, and then I have to add these in order to get the full information of this image. And I will repeat that on many scales, and again, and again. So let's try to have a visual uh, understanding of what these approximations do. So if I, I, I reconstruct, so I can always reconstruct by using all the information. But let's for the moment think of not using all the information, just using the very coarse information. You can see here that I wasn't really taking an average in difference. I must have done something that's more like the scheme I have on the board there. Because if I was just computing averages and differences, I would have here blocks of 32 by 32 that would be uniform gray level, no details. I have something much smoother than that. That's because I have used a, a smarter scheme. I've used, in fact, the scheme that is the scheme used for uh, a JPEG 2000 standard, which is uh, a 97 filter, and that gives you these smoother building blocks. As I add detail, you see, I get back my original image in the end. So let's look at a special case. Let's look at the case, uh, let, uh, let's look at two regions within the image. If I look at the uh, patch in the sky and a patch in the sail, and I go through the different uh, 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 approximations, then you see that in the sail, I need all the detail, but in, in, in the sky, very little is happening. I mean, in the sky, I didn't need fine scale labels in order to get a good resolution, and I didn't need them in the same. Uh, the reason why wavelengths are used in, in practice, I mean, uh, for instance, if you watch uh, sports games on ESPN, then uh, they typically have been uh, compressed with, with, uh, with wavelengths. Also, digital cinema in uh, many countries, I don't know what it's the case in Singapore, but in Europe and in the US, uh, uh, the scheme that's used is actually not an MPEG scheme, not motion uh, standard, but a JPEG scheme on every still. It's a JPEG 2000 scheme. So this was, from this information on the right, I can get back to the left. But I could also retain only the coefficients that I've colored red here, uh, uh, and then get the image on, on, on the left. It's not a perfect image. I mean, let's toggle back and forth, and you'll see that it's not perfect. But it's pretty good, I mean, for a compression factor of about 30. I mean, which, remember, every pixel here is 8-bit, so a factor of 30 is about enough to tell you whether a group of two or two by two of two, two pixels by two pixels is mostly white or mostly black. I mean, yet, by using it smarter, in a smarter way, I get this image. If I actually use also those green coefficients, I have a, a perfect image. Now, at ten, compression ratio of 10%, getting a perfect image is something that, when this standard was established, many, many, many schemes could already do. The more interesting thing is that uh, if you compress more, you have this very graceful extra degradation, which is something that uh, uh, other schemes were, were not so good at. Okay, uh, it's also very local. And let's illustrate that here. Imagine that you uh, have to retrieve data over a, a, a poor uh, connection uh, from a database that has things at very high resolution. Then you first go, go through thumb, uh, thumbprints and thumb, uh, thumbnails and uh, uh, in them identify the area for which you want the full detail, and you don't want to uh, wait minutes and minutes for the, the detail of all the other areas for which you're not interested, then uh, I would transmit the coordinates here. Because the information is so localized, <coughs> the database could nicely localize in, in, uh, in the coefficient space what it needs to send me, and then send me only that. And as I retrieve that, I recover full detail in the area of interest to me, and I haven't wasted any time on, on all the rest. So that was my blitz review of wavelengths. So um, let me recap a little bit of that, and uh, on the first uh, appl uh, application to, to, to uh, uh, paintings. Um, 
if, if I have here, this is a different painting by Van Gogh, it's, it's a, a pair of clocks. What I really am doing when I take these averages or, or glorified averages is computing a blur every time. I mean, uh, here I'm rendering it at the same resolution as the original, which I can, of course. I can always, from this down sample thing, go back. So, and I compute successive blurs. And what I am interested in seeing then is the difference I have lost. Here, that's the difference. You can hardly see anything, so let me emphasize it. This is what I get. So, let's zoom in on a, a small area of these blocks. And look, I have these successive blurs. And I'm giving you here the differences where the color is just artificial color to emphasize uh, science in the coefficients. So if I look at, at these successive differences, then there are things that stand out. First of all, edges uh, are things that you find everywhere, because an edge is something that exists at all scales. But there are also other things. I mean, in this area, for instance, if I enlarge it, you see that there's a little bit of structure there. Structure appears, and then structure disappears again. So details that are not like sharp edges emerge at some uh, scales and, and disappear at other scales. And this was something that we used in the, the, the very first application to, to artwork I did, which is actually the least interesting, and so I'll talk very little about it. Um, in in uh, about 10 years ago, uh, um, uh, Rick Johnson, who is an electrical engineer at, uh, in Cornell, uh, spent a sabbatical in the in, uh, Netherlands and uh, uh, got in touch with uh, people who worked, I mean, he met through friends, uh, people who were conservators at the Van Gogh Museum. And uh, because he's very interested in art, he, he, he was very interested in the visits that they gave him behind the scenes. And, and, and he was struck by the fact that they use a lot of signs, I mean chemistry, x-rays, infrared, and so on, but they were not using any image analysis. And he said, well, why not? Uh, image analysis can do a lot. They said, well, we are highly trained visual experts. What would it give it to us? And it's true that they are highly trained visual experts. They, they, they know things uh, about these Van Gogh paintings. And for instance, Van Gogh was not always very careful about uh, letting his paintings dry before he stacked them against each other with newspaper in between. And so they have identified the newspaper articles on which you find newsprint on some of these. Uh, so. Uh, but so he said, but you know, image analysis can do a lot. And he brokered a, a workshop where people interested in image analysis uh, were given data on the Van Gogh paintings at high resolutions, which was something that the Van Gogh Museum did not give, make available easily, and uh, uh, presented, on the other hand, results. Now, one of the things we were asked was uh, to uh, see whether we could quantify, uh, uh, in some way, uh, a difference in, in styles uh, between Van Gogh and other paintings. And so they gave us as a challenge paintings that uh, uh, was six, uh, something like a hundred and something paintings. Some of those paintings were paintings that at some point had been uh, thought to be by Van Gogh or were paintings that had influenced him when he was at the start of his career. Uh, paintings that were thought to be by Van Gogh, but some of them were forgeries, but others were paintings that were in his possession when he died. And uh, some of those were paintings that he had swapped with a young man who admired his, his work. And so they had uh, exchanged paintings. So he had a few paintings from this other young painter that he had exchanged for some of his own. In any case, what we did was we used exactly the features that we are uh, showing you here. So we did a decomposition into wavelets. And we then looked at uh, locally whether features emerged at some scales or, or and disappeared at what scale they emerged. We did that depending on the angle. So we used uh, something else on the wavelet basis I've, I've looked at, I've shown you here. We used something that had much better orientation resolution. And so we distilled from that some a, a feature vector for each patch of a painting of about uh, 100 entries. And then we compared patches of the same painting and patches of different paintings. And we used, we gauged that in order to uh, look at a similarity 
uh, uh, distance between different paintings. And then once we had that, we made the best possible projection of that data set in, 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 in three dimensions, and because we had to visualize this all, and we made a mobile out of it. And uh, so, because we had to explain this to uh, And so here the ones with red dots are the ones that are not by Van Gogh. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, there's one that's by Gauguin, there's one that's by, by this, this young man who, who admired Van Gogh. There's one here at the top, it's just emerging, that is a forgery. And so, uh, one thing that's striking is that on the one hand, all these red dots are near the outside of the cloud. So, uh, we did do a good job in, in finding difference in style. On the other hand, the forgery is not the furthest away. I mean, this, this forger did a good job in, in, in getting some of our Van Gogh style right. And uh, they wanted to specifically know whether we could uh, uh, detect forgeries. I mean, actually, that was not so much Van Gogh Museum as the television program Nova uh, that wanted to know whether we could do that. And uh, it turns out that you can do that with this analysis too, if you restrict yourself to the very fine scale wavelengths. Not all the wavelengths, but the very fine scales. Our interpretation for that is that when you try to imitate the style instead of painting naturally, you are more constrained, more contrived, and that gives more wobble at, at the very, very fine scales. But, uh, in any case, as I told you, this is not my favorite application. And uh, 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 we. Uh, But the, the great thing is that uh, I, I uh, okay, so I've told you this. Uh, the great thing is that after I, I did some work on this and I, I, I presented it at that workshop, there was Joris Dick, who is a, uh, 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 somebody who is a, a famous uh, material scientist and art historian, he has both degrees in the Netherlands, uh, uh, was there and he said, if given that you could do this, Maybe you can help me with this. And this is actually how we have gotten most of the interesting topics on which we've worked. Every time I give a presentation, something else comes out of the woodwork. I mean, uh, I try to give presentations to art historians and uh, art conservators for that reason. And uh, so Johannes Dick uh, and, and Kun Janssen uh, 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 had investigated this small painting by Van Gogh from his Paris period, it's a, a study of blooming grass. And it was known that if you turned this on its side and you looked at it uh, in, in x-rays, then uh, you could see that there was another painting underneath. Now that's not so striking. In Van Gogh's oeuvre, about 30% of the canvases have another work underneath because uh, many of, of these smaller paintings are studies, things in which he tried out uh, stuff. And canvas was expensive. And if he felt he had learned from this study what he wanted to learn from it, then a way of, of saving money was to cover it with a new layer of primer and paint something else on top. Uh, so, um, but this particular one was of special interest to art historians because it is a painting of his Paris period, yet the painting underneath is a portrait of a peasant woman of uh, his uh, Nunen period, which was, uh, Nunen is the small village where he lived with his parents and where he made lots of studies of peasant uh, uh, portraits prior to going to Paris. And uh, he was at that point in Nunen trying to uh, render color with a very dark palette. So he had a very strict palette and he wanted to nevertheless give an impression of color. And he was trying to see how he could do that. And there's a, a Van Gogh, a Vincent Van Gogh had a, a sustained correspondence with his brother Theo Van Gogh all his life. And uh, that correspondence has been preserved by the Van Gogh family. And uh, so there is a letter from Vincent to Theo saying that I'm sending you from Vincent to uh, Paris uh, uh, with this letter a, a painting in which I feel I particularly well succeeded in this goal of capturing <coughs> color with this very restrained palette. And although the letter survives, the painting did not. And so it's highly likely that the painting was in fact this painting underneath the patches of grass because once Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh uh, reached Paris, he met the Impressionists, he changed his style completely, 
and it's not um, impossible that this painting that he thought earlier was a very good example of this, this what, what he could achieve, now was no longer of any interest to him, and he would just use it to paint something else over it. So that was why people were interested, and Joris Dick had proposed to analyze it using um, a, a material science uh, uh, technology, uh, which is uh, X-ray fluorescence. Uh, so in X-ray fluorescence, a high uh, energy uh, X-ray uh, source is uh, uh, sent in and uh, excites, ionizes uh, uh, atoms that uh, are prone to fluorescence and so the, 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 the electron falls back in two steps and the fluorescence, uh, that uh, the fluorescent uh, photon that is, is, is given by the second uh, uh, fallback <coughs> in the ground state is characteristic for the, uh, uh, the atom that you're looking at. So uh, you can then look at the resulting spectrum in different spectral lines and so that gives you a picture of what this thing looks like in for instance the spectral line corresponding to molybdenum. Molybdenum uh, turned out to be uh, uh, one of the constituents of uh, 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 no, it's antimony. Uh, are one of the constituents of, of uh, uh, the Naples yellow that uh, uh, Van Gogh was using, and this is in uh, RC, which was uh, a component of the vermilion that he was using. So you see different colors can come out, and so uh, using this uh, technique, uh, uh, they uh, had gotten polarizing uh, the, 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 the impression, they got an impression of this, this ghost portrait underneath the Van Gogh. Uh, so about 10 years ago, if you Googled Van Gogh painting, uh, woman, I mean, you would get a ton of hits giving giving that picture. So, and this made the, the fame of Joris Dick, and X-ray fluorescence is now used routinely in order to examine uh, uh, this portrait, uh, the, the paint, underlying paintings. So, uh, but so they, as I said, they had colorized uh, uh, the painting and, and gotten this, but he said, but we don't know anything about image analysis. Maybe you can do better. And he said he gave us data very generously. And um, we had to do, I mean, there were quite a lot of things that needed to be done. First of all, there was a, uh, there were artifacts in the painting. There was this kind of zigzaggy things. These dark spots are spots where the top painting had an impasto and so could not be penetrated well by the x-rays. And so you have missing data. Now, why do you have a, a zigzag like that? The painting was scanned. In, in, in zigzag. Uh, I mean, every exposure uh, was sort of just one x-ray burst and then getting a spectrum and then the next one and so on. Uh, the x-ray source they used at that time, because the, no, no special purpose machines to do this had been constructed yet, this was a, a proof of concept, was a, uh, a synchrotron uh, that was in a teaching hospital in Amsterdam. It had taken more than a year of negotiation with the insurance company to actually get permission to move the painting to this to be, uh, in the target of the synchrotron beam. But uh, they had obtained that, and uh, so now the synchrotron beams. These, these are expensive things. So they they uh, there it was used to make short-lived radioactive components for the hospital purpose. And often this, the, the experimental setup is such that when not in its doing its day job, the beam is uh, sent instead to an experimental space where physicists help pay uh, for the instrument through the experiments they do. And so they had gotten some hours on that beam. And now the beam is fixed, so it was not going to scan that, that painting. So what happened was that the painting was on a sled that had to move in order to expose a lot of little pixel spots uh, for, for, for the beam. And apparently, and they only found out afterwards, there was a synchrony problem. I mean, of course, every so often the beam was going back to its day job, and then everything had to stop. And only when the beam came back could it start moving again. And there had been a synchronization problem, which is what caused these exact things. 
I mean, so pixels were missing in all over the place, and they didn't know exactly where. In order to make their uh, their picture, they had by Photoshop kind of uh, reshuffled some lines, but they were they knew there were many more breaks than they could find, and the first thing to do was to, to remedy them. So we we developed a, a an algorithm. Uh, uh, in fact, we minimized variation. I mean, because this has much higher variation than that. Uh, in order to 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 include possible breaks, they said there were at most five breaks per line, and so we. we found the placement of those breaks by optimizing in order to minimize the variation after the, the, the rearrangement. So we did that first. Then the next thing we did was to, uh, uh, well, to inpaint. I mean, there were spots where we were missing information, these black spots. And, well, you can do this with, with many images, and it exists now <coughs> in, in Photoshop. I mean, uh, uh, but. Uh, for a painting, you're even more justified than for a general, in, uh, a general image. Because a painting, after all, has been made by brush strokes. And you have information about a brush stroke before it entered that dark spot and after. And so you can infer what the brush stroke was. And so we, we, uh, we found all those things, we masked them, and we imported it. And then for the long stripes that were masked by the grass, we uh, uh, developed a different mask and uh, well we, we developed different inmating methods and we invaded that too. The one thing that was still missing was around the eyes we had some, some spots that we uh, we didn't really know how to do that and we asked the art conservators and they said oh and we have loss of paint around an eye we use the other eye for information we use that all the time so we said well we can do that too. <laughs> and uh, we did. And so you see the inpainting is very sensitive. I mean, look here is this, this dark spot and so on. It, it, really, it really works very nicely. So after that, we needed to work with color information. Uh, it turned out that the colors for which we had the, uh, uh, the uh, information from the X-ray fluorescence were not sufficient to really span the full RGB. We were missing all the earth, uh, earth colors. And we also had uh, no information about the blue. But it turned out, and I, 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 I didn't find the slide anymore, so I'll have to tell it to do the words. It turned out and that if we decomposed, not in red, green, blue, but in something that is done often for, for images, where you just first take the, the, the red and white version, the gray value version, which is luminance, and then for color, you still have to uh, find you have to find where on the color wheel you are, and then you have to look at saturation within the color. So if we looked at the chromats for these two images, uh, for 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 uh, actually, did I have the image? No, I don't. If we looked at the chromats of images that Van Gogh painted during this period, we we looked at portraits that had very high contrast and very low <coughs> contrast, and they looked very different. And, but then if you look at the chromats, it turns out they were very, very similar. And that gave us the basis to then interpolate between uh, the information we had and so on. And this is what we finally got out of it. So she really came alive much more. And uh, now we were very happy with that result. Um, and then what happened is that after I gave a talk about this, uh, uh, people at the North Carolina Museum of Art, where in the meantime I moved to look, said, oh, let's tell you about things we would like to, to investigate. And so we uh, uh, started working, and we're still working, on a very, very famous altarpiece uh, by uh, Giotto, uh, which is one of the, the big... Uh, uh, big famous things in, in that museum, which is, if you ever are in Raleigh, North Carolina, I really recommend it. It's a very, very nice museum. Uh, uh, but that project is not finished because at some point during our work on, on Giotto, uh, uh, they mentioned to me that they had uh, uh, an interesting uh, problem with a different altarpiece, a much less famous altarpiece, by uh, uh, somebody called Francisco Cuccio Gisi. They had, they have three panels from an altarpiece, of which one more is in Portland. Three more are in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The central one is in the, uh, in, in, uh, the 
Chicago Institute uh, of, of Art. Um, and it was only realized sometime in the, uh, in the 80s that these all belong to the same altar piece. I mean, and after it was realized, it became very clear from painting elements uh, and techniques used and so on that they did indeed all belong together. And the people at the North Carolina Museum of Art had dreamt of making an exhibition where they would all be reunited. And the other museums had not as much interest because they said, the last panel is missing anyway. So why? I mean, you still won't have a complete album. So, uh, uh, now I had worked, uh, I knew and, and uh, I, have a, uh, uh, I had worked with, uh, uh, and she's become a very good friend, uh, Charlotte Caspers, who is an artist and an art conservator herself, and who is, uh, 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 apart from her own art, she also does for educational projects reconstructions of artworks using the original techniques uh, uh, to, to make reconstructions of, in this case, a young boss. Uh, she has done several for many museums in the Netherlands. Uh, for one thing, you can, you can give kids a, a, a copy of a detail painted by Charlotte Caspers to examine and to see what it gives under infrared and so on. You can't give them an original painting. So, uh, but they still get something that has all the, the she also has painted paintings in which she, she shows all the layers of preparation but she stops half an inch short every time so that you see the layered structure of the paintings. Anyway, so they commissioned from her a uh, reconstruction of that missing panel. We say, well, it's one thing to reconstruct a panel that we have in the museum to show to so that people can manipulate it. It's another to reconstruct something you've never seen. But it turned out, it turns out that this altarpiece uh, recounts, like many altarpieces do, do, a story. And the story it, can, uh, it recounts is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, missing eight. Uh, the uh, life of uh, John the Evangelist, uh, but not just but the life of John the Evangelist as recounted in the Golden Legend, which is a medieval kind of bestseller. And uh, uh, we know it's a, it was a very popular book because many medieval books we have only fragments of, and of this there exists multiple, multiple very many copies of the full thing, so everybody must have wanted one. Uh, so, uh, uh, oops, oh my god. Sorry, uh, if, if my battery gives out, and we are in trouble, so... I had forgotten to pull the switch. Okay, so, uh, since it followed the Golden Legend, and the scenes could be identified completely, it allowed to guess what the final scene must have been. And so, uh, Schotter then made a, uh, together with the curator at the museum, a, uh, a sketch of the scene, which was the baptism of the man who had challenged uh, John. Uh, I mean, here John is, is, is praying, is, 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 is causing the collapse of a temple after the, 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 the challenger has said, uh, look, my gods will smash your temple and nothing happened to the church. But then John prayed and the, the, the heathen temple collapsed. And then uh, uh, the, the same uh, priest uh, uh, told him, look, if your God is so mighty, then uh, drink the dregs of this poison cup uh, that we just used to execute this, these two criminals and the sea. And that's what John drinks in that house. Spring, he's, he's, he's alive and that's so on. So uh, the, the, uh, at that time, uh, after that, this, this man says, okay, uh, you win and convert. And so the final <laughs> is, is his baptism by John. And uh, so she made a composition that was fitting with the style of the rest. And so, so if ever they find this missing balance, of course, going to be different from this. I mean, you can't just get. The, but it's the idea was to make a panel that would fit. That if the original panel had been replaced in the 14th century by the new panel, it would have not surprised. People. Okay, so here you see her at work. I mean, she actually, the whole process of making this was wonderful, and a documentary was made of her 
making this and the final result is absolutely gorgeous. And then they realized, I mean, so they have thought of the fact that they would have this beautiful new panel, they would have a documentary of how these things were painted all for this exhibit. The other museums had said, oh yeah, this makes it more interesting and had agreed to, to, to lend their paintings. Um, but then they realized that, uh, I mean, the gold, I mean, there's gold gilding behind and it's gleaming and it, it really shows how these paintings must have looked like with, with the candles in the churches reflecting the light and so on. I mean, now we don't see that anymore. When you see these 14th century paintings, this gilded background looks kind of a, a dirty mustard yellow uh, uh, and, and you have no gleaming anymore. It used to be burnished. And, and, uh, they can't do that anymore because it would all flake off. I mean, uh, but uh, but then they realized that they couldn't put it next to the other ones <laughs> because it would have uh, uh, everybody would have looked only at the new shiny one instead of, of all the other authentic <laughs> ones. And so um, what we then did was we, uh, we used image processing. We studied the old panels, the new panels. We used wave painting and many other things. To, uh, uh, and image processing tools to uh, uh, virtually age the new panel. And so a printout of that was then exposed in the exhibit that has taken place in the meantime, next to the other panels. And the new panel was held separate, so that people could admire it, and so on, and compare with the older panels. And a documentary showing its, its whole uh, 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 manufacturer was shown uh, but we so for that we had to do a whole lot of different uh, uh, things we had to uh, uh, remap the colors we had to uh, introduce cracks we had to age the gold before but it occurred to us that uh, if we did all that we could and here you see a, a, a photograph of the, the reunited work with uh, the aged copy, it occurred to us that if we did all that, we could also rejuvenate the old panels, do the reverse. And uh, the, the, the museum allowed us to do that, so what we had to do was to detect and inpaint the cracks uh, uh, using the color correspondent remap and then do the rejuvenation of the gold leaf work. So, um, cracks. So, these paintings are very densely cracked. I mean, uh, very old paintings on wood panel all have this kind of crack. It depends on the wood and the, the fabrication techniques. And so, from one painting to the other, they may differ quite a lot. But uh, so um, now, I was confident that we would be able to detect the in paint cracks. In painting, you've seen on the Van Gogh. I mean, you can do that, and you can do it in Photoshop and so on. Detecting the cracks turned out to be much harder than I expected. In fact, ultimately it became part of the PhD thesis of uh, electrical engineering students in Brussels. I mean, because it was way harder to do this. I mean, first of all, the cracked pixels don't have the same color, all. And uh, all the browns that you find in these cracks are also browns that you find in the painting itself, and so on. Nevertheless, I was convinced that we could do it because we had done it before. We had done it in a more challenging situation on a, uh, on a painting, uh, 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 an altarpiece that's actually one century younger. That's a very famous altarpiece in, in Belgium by Jan van Eyck. Uh, this painting is uh, uh, one of the, the uh, early Renaissance paintings that was incredibly influential in its time. And in fact, although the main, the name of the painting in Dutch is, is the mystery of the adoration of the lamb, is, is this panel. This panel is actually painterly the least interesting panel. The other panels, this painting, this was probably painted by Hubert Hubert van Eyck, who was the older brother, while, uh, who died after, uh, while this commission was, was, was still not finished. And his brother Jan van Eyck, who was the greater painter, finished, uh, did all the rest. So, uh, um, it's a polyptych. When you close it, this is what it looks like on the other side. And the question for which we did the craquelure, uh, uh, for which we ended up doing a, a craquelure detection, uh, was uh, this painting here, 
on the front, which is a scene of the Annunciation, which is a theological thing in, in Catholic religion, uh, showing a, a book in the background. And uh, here you see a blow-up of that painting of a book. And uh, art historians were very interested in this depiction uh, because Jan van Eyck was an incredible perfectionist and some people, some of the art historians were convinced that he actually had painted a real text on this little fragment of about three inches high, I mean, so it's about eight centimeters high, uh, on, on this enormous painting. Uh, others said, no way. I mean, and the reason they, they, they couldn't decide was that they couldn't read this thing. Now, this, it's, it's the painting of a manuscript text uh, of, in the 15th century, uh, which was written in what they call littera formata, which is letters that all look like little vertical and horizontal bars to me. I mean, I can't read this in a museum, even without Kakulu, but experts can. But they couldn't read this because the cracks distracted. I mean, they, 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 it's very hard. Our eyes are incredibly good at some things. I mean, we can, we can uh, see things that you can only half guess and so on. But we are very bad at other things. And thinking away cracks like that is something we're bad at. And so uh, I said, well, image analysis probably can help you. But it was, in fact, very hard because many of the cracks are in the same direction as the browns of the letters. The browns were very similar and so on. So in order to do it, it was, it was a detailed job and so on. And some, some uh, early machine learning was used for that. Uh, uh, um, but so what we did is we detected. And then once we detected, we would impaint. And this had been the result. Um, now, when I first saw the result after impainting, I mean, Bruno Cornelius, a student who did this, was very, very excited. And I thought, oh my god. I mean, that lot of good that has done, it's just as illegible. <laughs> but, uh, but it was not the experts. Experts could now, on that page, recognize 12 groups of letters that formed words, and so on, which was enough to not only unambiguously uh, ascertain that this was a text, but they could identify the text. The text was actually uh, a page of uh, a copy of a book on the Annunciation by Thomas Aquinas that had been copied in Bruges, in the monastery of Bruges, uh, 20 years ago. <coughs> so it had meaning, because it was a book on the scene that was <coughs> illustrated in the painting. And uh, now a project is to actually try to determine which of the copies, whenever a book was copied by hand, several copies were made and dispersed, which of those copies was used. So they were very, very excited. But so I knew we could do cracks. I mean, we've done it before. Here you see what crack detection does on, on one of these gissy things. So here you see the crack and the impainting of the crack. We tried to be very sensitive to only, be, the, the goal was not to make a chromo of this. I mean, we could have done that by, by just coloring by hand. Uh, we, we, we wanted to be scholarly about it, I mean, and uh, use only uh, uh, things that we could justify based on, 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 on algorithms and, and study of the remainder. And so you see it was an iterative algorithm and gradually the cracks are embedded. They're not, oops, oh no. Any key, any key. that we had, uh, I mean, of course, the, 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 when, when a painting by, uh, uh, when Charlotte had painted her new panel, uh, she 
And when Marshall made her knee painting, the choice of the pigments she had used here was based on a chemical analysis of the pigments of the old plants. But so we actually had a painting, and the composition was very similar. So we had, uh, for many of the pigments, we had a correspondence between old and new. And so we could use that in order to help us color it. It was not just a simple red, green, blue, because different pigments had moved in different ways. So, uh, but for instance, I mean, here, you have the same thing with the gold removed. The gold had done to do something separately. Uh, we could, on, based on that correspondence, go from the old colors to the new colors on the old panel. And we could similarly, um, from the new freshly painted thing, go back to aged colors. We also uh, used the, our study of, of cracks in order to do the crack pattern. So the cracks, we did not do a physical model of cracking materials, I mean, which would have been scholarly even better. I mean, but I mean, there was a limit to what we could do, and we just did image analysis, but we, we glued cracks on the image. Um, and this was the one that, that actually was used in the exhibition. And then finally, we also needed to rejuvenate the gold. So here you have a photograph of, uh, on an angle of, of, the, of the blue panel. And there are a number of interesting things. First of all, you see the gold gleaming. You see also there are punch marks around the head of the saint here. Uh, those were, so the, the, the material was made with an, a, a slightly uh, elastic uh, layer of, of, gizzo, of, 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 of gypsum underneath so that the gold could, over some, some bolus layers, could then be polished. And then with sharp punch marks, little uh, depressions could be hammered into it, which would then uh, reflect light and scatter light and give this, this light aura around the heads. With aging, not only does the gold become duller and cracks, and so it loses its luster, but also dust accumulates in these. And typically in old paintings, you see all that that was more light and scattering light and bright as dark rings now. So uh, we wanted to restore all that to, uh, 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 to, to this glory to the old pants. Uh, yeah, here you see the punch marks that had been made by uh, commissioned by Charlotte so that she could make her reconstruction. Here you see what these punch marks still look like, I mean, and how they flake off and so on, um, on the original paintings. And so what we did is we found, um, we, we, we knew what the punch marks were, we located them everywhere, we, uh, and that has, was then used as a basis to, uh, for a rendering. So finally, in order to really get an idea of what these paintings look like, we took the painted areas that we had restored virtually, and we then used, and now we get back to computer graphics, uh, we asked uh, an artist uh, uh, who, who uses computer graphics in his work to uh, then model these things as a plank with gleaming gold, and uh, he had to work a little bit to make it look reasonable and not artificial, and then put in the punch marks to change the reflections, and, uh, and, and that gave us uh, uh, the, the rendering uh, that I'm going to show you now. Um, so. <coughs> so all the painted areas were restored. Uh, by the techniques I illustrated, and then the gold was added. And you see. 
see with the reflections and, and uh, And so this rejuvenation was played in the museum. So in the museum, there was the reunited with our virtual printout. There was another wall that had the repainted panel with an explanation of materials. There was one wall that had a documentary on how the thing was made. And then there was one wall explaining digital techniques and showing this on a large screen. Uh, to, and uh, the result of, of the, the whole endeavor was that uh, many, many, many more people came to uh, this exhibition than the museum had originally expected. Because this mix of technology and art really appealed widely and was written up widely. And so it brought uh, people to, to, to view this piece of, of art that probably never would have cared otherwise. So they were very excited about it. And, uh, and we are now working on, on further projects, seeing whether the experience we gained in this particular artwork could be made into a workflow that uh, uh, you know, people who like working with their computers could help uh, rejuvenate other paintings in museums. But I've already gone for the time and I should stop. So, uh, yes. So, uh, in the in the computer graphics video, we saw the, the one frame in the lower right is a new painting, but also rendered with computer graphics by yeah. using the same trick. Exactly. Goal, we, we we decided that the thing is, it was very hard. Um, okay, there were two reasons for that. First of all, we wanted to have the same kind of visual experience for the new painting, so we kept the new painting, we didn't do anything on, on the we sectioned out, the, uh, but we did some the same thing on the gold. Well, not on this one, on, on, on the one you saw yeah. in the movie. Um, there, uh, we wanted to give that same impression. It was very hard to film it so as to get that same impression. I mean, we also had to to uh, use a, 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 a reflection, I forget what the name is for this thing, this, 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 this whole reflection thing that, that you see in gleaming in the background, and that was of course a different one than we had in the, in the, in the, job, in, in the, in the, in the museum. We, we thought about measuring it there and using that one, but it became kind of complicated. Uh, um, the other reason is that uh, the gold in, in uh, maybe we can see it in, in, in the talk a little bit. Um, yeah, the gold here, you don't see it so very much, but here you can see it a little bit, was a little bit streaky. And the reason is that uh, uh, in, in agreement with the curator, uh, Charlotte used exactly the techniques as they were described in a manual for Italian painters of that time. It was uh, an experiment in really following all the steps of that manual. And they realized uh, uh, too late that the polishing technique that he described would have probably given a completely uniform gleam on the thicker gold foil that was used in the Middle Ages, but not the much thinner gold foil that is now used. And so it led to streakiness that, and so we didn't want to give that streaky impression. So that's the other reason. I was really impressed by the, besides that, but this, uh, the, when you were looking at the Van Gogh and trying to distinguish Van Gogh from other painters uh -huh. where they didn't have the information and the fact that you were able to also detect counterfeiters. Yes. Counterfeiters is something, and you mentioned it, when an artist is trying to reproduce an existing piece of art, his or her own painting is going to be constrained mm -hmm. because there is yes. a mold yes. to look at. But in the case where you have two artists that express themselves on the canvas, you don't have that.
So why were the, did you notice signatures? I mean, why, why were the ultimately the signatures okay, that, so, uh, so we, that established that uh, well, classification? First, first of all, I, I, I mean, uh, let me go on the record here that I, I do not, I do not go into into uh, certifying or trying to certify. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, I have no authority, and I, uh, I mean, my credibility with museums would suffer enormously. But uh, um, the, the uh, yes, you can, you can. We did for Van Gogh uh, uh, find some characteristic things. For instance, uh, features in in at certain scales emerge at different uh, uh, scales depending on the angle. In, in which you paint, in which is probably a, a, an artifact from, from how you hold your, 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 uh, your brushes. Um, we actually, uh, in order to have a proof of concept, whether it was even possible to make a distinction between painting uh, uh, freehand or painting in a constrained style, a style where you were trying to mimic brush strokes in another painting. Uh, we asked Charlotte because she is trained to actually reconstruct. I mean, she has that special training. We asked her to uh, make some uh, uh, paintings herself, and then use her copying technique to copy her own <coughs> paintings. Copy. So, so as to have a data set in which you had as few confounding variables as possible. I mean, they would be painted under the same light circumstances by the same person with the same materials. And what we found, we have two data sets, one which are just oil sketches uh, that were rapidly executed paintings in 2008, but one which, another one that in, from 2012 where she uh, really painted uh, portraits of, of North Carolina birds in several layers and then copies of those, uh, where uh, we have found that it's, it's certainly not something that, that we can say with an enormous high degree of certainty, but uh, uh, we pretty accurately can, can tell whether a painting is freehand painting by her or, 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 or constrained in that way. Typically one of those copy sticks are longer than a freehand painting because she has to constantly monitor what she's doing. And, uh, um, and she was surprised by that herself. So in the second data set, first data set, we, we knew all the information and we just did the standard way, I mean, training and testing and so on. For the second data set, because uh, art, uh, uh, art historians don't really believe this whole business about, uh, the algorithm doesn't know. I mean, so we actually, it, it really is blind for us. So she wrote down the code of what sign on the back does indicate this was the original or was not uh, for each pair of paintings uh, on a piece of sheet of paper that uh, the art history department has under seal. And, uh, and every time we, 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 we feel confident about a new pair because we, we try to change the techniques and so on, uh, that information publicly gets unveiled. We first say what we have and then it gets unveiled. And we have, so far we've done it right. Now, uh, now it is like a Van Gogh's uh, painting. You have all uh, lots of his painting, and also you have uh, all the data. Whether you think that this is uh, like a use is a learning algorithm, you have studied the character of feature of this uh, stroke or whatever data. Yes. It's possible to make it uh, catch much much more features than we have can catch now by way of the <coughs> Uh, so, it, it, it would be interesting because, I mean, the first study we did was in, in, in 2008. Meantime, a lot of yeah, happened that's, in, that's a in image, image learning. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, to revisit, uh, 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 we'd have to contact the Van Gogh Museum to see whether they would agree. Because, because it was, talking about constraints, it, it was very, we, we, they, 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 we had very strict constraints on, on what we using could the use data. the data. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, I had to sign my soul away in case they ever leave. I mean, and they haven't. But uh, also, uh, the so there were two workshops, two successive workshops at which we got data on the Van Gogh paintings. The first workshop we got a gray level only, mm -hmm. because even though we had signed all these contracts and, and so on, uh, 
they still were very protective. And, mm. and there's not a big market for high resolution, <coughs> ray level uh, reproductions of Van Gogh. So, I mean, color is important. Uh, for the second data, uh, data set, they actually gave us color, but they gave us color only in a checkerboard pattern. Mm -hmm. So, uh, they, they, uh, well, they gave us color on half the painting, and on the other half, they gave us a checkerboard pattern of color so that we wouldn't be able to reprint a uh, high resolution. And, uh, and I actually, I thought about it and uh, I debated it with my, 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 my colleagues because with the high resolution ray level mm -hmm. and with that partial color information, of course we, we could construct everything. <laughs> and uh, I debated whether I would, I would tell them or not. And I figured that I had to because I figured if they had found out later that I knew I could do this and I had not told them, mm. then they would be right not to trust me. Mm. I mean, so I, I actually, at the workshop, I, I took her aside and said, I want to show you something. Mm. And I showed her uh, the result of iterative algorithm reconstructing of the And she, she, she blanched. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she said, I didn't know you could do that. I said, I know you didn't. I said, um, don't worry. I mean, we won't and so on. But I said that does mean that, and I don't think you should be so protective about the data, I think, uh, but, but if you do want to be, then you really should ask the advice of an expert first <laughs> before, before you make partial data. So, so for, the miss, for the last missing piece, the story, story is not from uh, my Michael the story is uh, from uh, the corner water. You know, you're missing yes. how do you know that last us in the Oh, story? because we the story is is the story of the life of John the Evangelist as described in that book. Yeah, in the book, yeah. The, the book had all the seven scenes okay. and the eight big scene that was They're missing also, yeah. was that baptism. So can, can uh, this technology be applied to audio, for example? Uh, Restoration or rejuvenation? Actually, uh, or is it completely different? No, no, it's 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 different, and it will be different techniques. But people have been restoring audio exactly yeah. like that. I mean, in fact, there's somebody who does very very interesting work in at Stanford on audio uh, uh, restoration, uh, where uh, he looks at uh, old, uh, uh, very old rec records that uh, I mean even. Uh, uh, and, and he reads them optically. So uh, the old recording mechanism before the digital, before the, the, the music CD, uh, every time you played it, you, uh, you eroded it a little bit. And uh, so he gets the signal optically, and then from the optics, reconstructs the audio signal so that there's no more erosion of the data. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there have been partial reconstruction from, from things on wax cylinders, I mean, even before 78 uh, 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 RPM uh, records. Can they, can they do it to such an extent that the recording would sound almost like a modern recording? Or? I, I, I doubt it. I mean, I, I, but still, uh, what they can do is, for instance, there have been, uh, the, uh, there was a piece of music um, composed by Brahms that was directed by Brahms. And uh, they, so they can hear how the temples and so on, he would have, he himself uh, directed it. Okay, so let us thank uh, Professor Dabrushi for a very, very interesting talk.